You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in vertex. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect. But expecting more. You keep going as the ocean falls. Falls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello everyone and welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian apologetics and scholarship, and today will be no exception. We've got a really treasured guest on here today. Before getting him, I'd like to let everyone know that we're being carried now on the Universal Pentecostal Network. Some shows are going to be live, some won't be right now due to technical difficulties. This one isn't live, but thank, welcome aboard to all new listeners here. And I hope you'll keep listening. Today, my guest has been foundational in the Christian apologetics ministry for quite some time. He's a he's one of the ones that I read when I was in Bible college. He's a retired senior editor and campus lecturer for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. He holds a Ph.D. in English from the University of Missouri, an M.A. in English from Washington State University, and the B.A. in Chemistry in English from the University of Nebraska. He served as an officer in the U.S. He's taught English, philosophy, and theology at a number of universities. And he served as associate professor of English at Nebraska Wesleyan University and Northern Illinois University. Over the past 30 years, he has taught short courses at the University of Delaware, Regent College in Vancouver, Wheaton Graduate School, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Biola, University of the Nations, ETS, Ostrzec in Croatia, Biblical Theological Seminary, Roklaw in Poland, and many other academic institutions in the U.S. and Europe. He is the author of several books, including, and this is where some of you probably recognize who I'm talking about, The Universe Next Door, Scripture Twisting, Discipleship of the Mind, Chris Christman Goes to College, Why Should Anyone Believe Anything at All, Habits of a Mind, Intellectual Life as a Christian Calling, Vaclav Havar, The Intellectual Conscience of International Politics, Naming the Elephant, Worldview as a Concept, <laughs> Learning to Pray with the Psalms, Why Good Arguments are Often Fair, A Little Handbook on Humble Apologetics, Praying the Psalms of Jesus, <laughs> Deepest Differences, A Christian Atheist Dialogue with Carl Pereno, and Women of the Sand Heroes in ebook. His most recent publications are Echoes of a Voice, We Are Not Alone, and A Project Beyond Reason, Why Seeing is Believing. He's lectured on over 250 university campuses in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. During one typical academic year, he's spoken on over 20 campuses in the U.S., several in Croatia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Most recent lectures were sponsored by his Bulgarian publisher and given in June 2012 in Sofia. He's addressed groups of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty with talks that range from pre-evangelistic and evangelistic to academic and analytic on topics of interest to students and faculty in the arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and technical fields. And he counts among his interests the application of worldview thinking to the integration of Christian faith and the academic disciplines, the critiques of worldview analysis as a major form of Christian critical thought, and of understanding modern ancient cultures and the nature of signals of transcendence in their relation to Christian life, especially of projects. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> All this is to welcome my guest, Dr. James Sire. Welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. Well, I'm glad to be with you. Uh, I must be old. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone can do that if they get to be 80 get to be 80, or it's about two weeks, 81. Mmm, well, happy birthday in advance. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've, been, of, yeah, you've been in this field for quite some time. Has it been incredible to see the rise of interest in Christian apologetics? Uh, yeah. I, I, I think in a way, I asked my first apologetics question, I was about the seventh grade, eighth grade, somewhere along in there. Mm-hmm. What I asked was essentially the question about predestination and free will. Right. And the answer I got, just as good now as it was then, 
I don't remember what it was, but I've never received an answer that I could try to try every one of my questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was in Bible college, we were assigned to read your book, The Universe Next Door, in studying worldviews. And one time my professor of preaching recommended I go for a book called Scripture Twisting. Not sure if that was a compliment or not, considering I just got done giving a message, but I hope I hadn't twisted things too badly. But I read both of those, and I did go through your book also, Why Should Anyone Believe Anything at All? And recently I've gone through your latest three books. One of them came from IVP, and two of them came from you personally, and I thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And really, again, I... Well, I can't give you another one. I don't expect to write anymore. Mm. I, I, think, uh, I think my publisher thinks I've done my swan song, and I'll be quite happy with that. Mm. Well, the first book we're going to be talking about, because most listeners will know, I usually can ask the question of how did you get to be doing what you're doing today, but that's what your first book is about, Rim of the Sand Hills. Now, some people might be wondering about that title. What does that mean, Rim of the Sand Hills? Actually, it's a title I stole from a book that was written in about 1939. It's a book about the uh, an area just outside this huge... 19,300-acre uh, area of not sand and not just dunes, but sand dunes covered with uh, rich, lush grass that makes wonderful ranch land. It's a beautiful place. Nebraska doesn't have a lot geologically to brag about, but it can certainly brag about those sand hills. Uh, the river of sand hills is, of course, just outside the edge of that on the ordinary sort of lowest that you find in Iowa and so forth. Mm -hmm. But so I lived out there, but I loved the sand hills. They were a mythological place for me. Uh, and then I was in, when I was in college, I worked out there in the summer. I could make twice as much in the sand hills during haying season as I could make at home. Mm -hmm. But and doing the same kind of work. Okay. Now that kind of work, when you were growing up, that consisted pretty much of farm work, didn't it? Farm work and, uh, and ranching work, yes. What would a typical day on the sand hills doing that kind of work consist of? Well, in the, in the summer, which is the only time I actually was in the sand hills, you wait until the grass is ready, at least I didn't get employed, until the grass is ready to be mowed and put in the windrows and swept and stacked and stacked. So a morning for me was on a tractor uh, all the way from... Uh, so the dew would get off the grass, maybe 7, 8 o'clock. And then I would go to 7, 8 o'clock sometimes in the evening uh, because the, obviously there's no dew that early in the evening. Uh, so I would be driving a tractor with a 7-foot power mower, mowing all day, all day, all day with a break for lunch. And the break was usually in the field with the something that the uh, farmer's wife had brought out or something that was uh, maybe we would get together for a, for a time with the other workers in the field. Mm -hmm. But I was basically a, 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 a mower and a raker. Mm -hmm. uh, I, did, I wanted to stay out of a stack, like haystack as a stacker because uh, I had hay fever and that was no place to be. Now, you grew up in a Christian home also, right? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was what was it like growing up in a Christian home? How how was Christianity treated in your house? Well, we lived on a ranch, a, a farm on a ranch, small farm on a ranch, just outside the Sand Hills themselves, on Eagle Creek. And uh, as far as the Christianity was concerned, we were too far away to attend the church, excepting in the summers when we attended a a church that met in a schoolhouse about six miles from our from our ranch. Uh, the Christianity came to me primarily through my, my mother, who taught us uh, Presbyterian Sunday school lessons that she got from her brother, mm -hmm. and uh, from the radio. Mm -hmm. Listened to the fuller hour uh, on the radio, and uh, I listened to the Lutheran hour. Mm -hmm. uh, remember uh, old Fuller saying as he was reading letters from the listeners, Now, Mother, 
I read another letter from one of our listeners, and then this is uh, where we get to read the letter that would be, of course, a, a wonderful, mostly sentimental letter about the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. I learned about music from two, places, two things. We had a pup organ that only one pedal would work, but it was enough to get some air into the, uh, into the organ. So I, and we had some music around. I learned uh, a few melodies, that sort of thing, on the pup organ. And then, of course, there was the music on the Luther now, which was wonderful hymns. Mm -hmm. Hymns that when we moved the car and went to a Baptist type evangelical church, I didn't think we could sing there. <laughs> it was Luther. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't sing Lutheran songs. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I found out that they were singing Lutheran songs in our church just as much as they were in the Lutheran church down the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting you talk about music cars. A couple of weeks ago on this program, I interviewed Rick Matson. He's written a book for IVP called Faith is Like Skydiving, and he sees you as highly instrumental. He talks about you quite often, I think, in this book, and one of the things he said you told him was, use your music as part of your evangelism. I never did any music as a part of evangelism. Rick did. Yeah. Rick very much a musical guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now when I got together with uh, my, my buddies over the summer camp, my guitar sang only uh, folk, pretty much folk songs and, mm -hmm. and very simple um, very simple tunes. I never really developed that as a ministry. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were talking about the uh, Christianity that you grew up in, now you didn't make it your own until later on in life, right? Uh, well, it depends on how, how long later on is. I, I didn't become a Christian as a child. Mm -hmm. I did become a Christian just as I was moving from childhood into manhood. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, uh, it was just before the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we went to a church as we moved into Butte by that time. We were off, off the ranch. Mm -hmm. I had all my little education and primary education on at a one-room country schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. But we moved to town. We moved a block away from the high from the school and high school, and across the street from the youth community church. Mm -hmm. And that's where we uh, where we went to church. And that's when Pastor Ward Smith, an ordinary kind of Baptist type preacher, gave the gospel. And within three or four weeks, five weeks or so, I had had things I worried about and wondered about myself as a younger person, he explained what it is that would make you right with God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that. I understand, though, from your book, it wasn't something immediate, but you pretty much panicked in some ways the first time you heard a message <laughs> that you passed out, and there was your mother who said, Son, was it something the preacher said? And my mom quit. Uh, asked me that, yeah, and yep. I said, yes, mommy. Mm -hmm. And the next week, I walked forward. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, if I were, if I had been a Pentecostal then, I would have said, oh, I've been slain by the Spirit. <laughs> now that I'm a Presbyterian, and I publish books at the university on a lot of charismatic things, I'm willing to say, yeah, I probably, it probably was. Mm -hmm. a, being by the Holy Spirit. Uh, a signal of transcendence that was very, 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 very immediate and very, very personal. Now, since you talk about books, you also came to love books pretty early on in your life, didn't you? Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had many, but some of the books we had were really quite good. They were ordinary novels. There was no trashy novel in, mm -hmm. the, in the bunch. I remember reading uh, a novel which I thought, oh, this would be a really good professional novel. Listen to who uh, the author is. The author is Raphael uh, Raphael Sabatini, and the title was Scaramouch. Mm. Now, that isn't a, you know, that is a great book. I don't know what it is. Actually, that was my thought then. It was, it was, it was a thriller, but it was a very good one. Mm -hmm. But others like uh, William, uh, James Fadimore Cooper, and Jules Verne, uh, good storytellers. Mm -hmm. Rachel Horndor stories. Mm -hmm. Saturday Evening Post, Colliers. These are magazines that no longer exist, 
Right. But this bug is filled with stories and loud and quite well written. You know, my, uh, my dad was born on a Saturday at tree and he's got a, an item of his house that someone gave him as a gift. His best friend actually, it's a, <coughs> a blow-up poster of a Saturday evening post from the day he was born. <laughs> yep. Now, I had a Rockwell love and Rockwell cover, too. Or would that have been maybe the... No, yeah, now, your dad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should have been a, a Norman Rockwell cover. Yep, it was. I'm pretty sure it was. Now, you also, early on, uh, saw, got a job when you went into the city life that most of us would consider a dream job, which was running the movie theater, pretty much a projection booth. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and you're, want, you're wanting me to tell you what I did with that job when I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, the church I went to had a lot of these no's involved in it. No drinking, no smoking, no gambling, no whatever. Mm -hmm. And included no movies. Uh, and I don't think it included no television. There was not enough of a, a lot of television at that point. Mm -hmm. But no movies. So I didn't know that when I started to get, had the job, even though by that time I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I was rubbing these movies and I thought I got feeling guilty about doing so. Uh, and I told the boss, I said, well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, not, I'm quitting. I, I really need to quit. And he argued with me, and I told him why, and he wouldn't hold that. He wanted me so badly. Why? I don't know. Well, I guess I was trained, and he'd have to figure out somebody else who was uh, mm. honest enough and trustworthy enough to run the machinery. <laughs> Finally, when I told him that I... I wouldn't work for him if the theater burned down. I didn't, I didn't realize what I just said, of course. <laughs> he said, oh, okay, all right, all right. That's <laughs> not funny. Now, now, I know, now I know why that uh, was so bad for him. I was, of course, for me it was a metaphor. That's <laughs> awful. Now, when it came time... But uh, let me let me okay. go on and say that by the time I got into college, became involved in university, I realized that that really wasn't uh, a no no that needed to be taken. Mm. Uh, absolutely no no. It's a good idea for for a lot of reasons, but it's uh, that's not really something that you focus on. Eventually, I got rid of all the other no nos as no no. Mm. Well, maybe not getting yeah, it's not getting drunk in any case, but. Yeah. Uh, I took up smoking for a short period of time and didn't really feel terribly guilty about that. Mm -hmm. Even though my wife, when she saw me with a pipe in my mouth, a uh, picture from Korea, she she started the buffer microscope and wept, she tells me. Mm. So I was always kind to my wife. So there you are, have it from Dr. Sal. He's no longer going to condemn you if you're watching movies at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how about when it came time for you to choose a place to further your education? How did that come about? Well, uh, because my pastor, a very good one really, a Baptist trained pastor with kids who had gone to Bethel Seminary and Bethel College, uh, Baptist school in Minnesota, a very good one. Uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go there. And I also found, I heard that there was a Believe it or not, I had enough moxie to catch on this one. A man who was a philosopher, and he was very good, and, and eventually I heard him with intervarsity. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go there. My dad said, no, 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 no. no and I, we argued. We, uh, somebody told me the other day, and I guess it's true, I've never paid too much attention to it. Every boy needs to make a break from his father. Well... I was in the process of making a break with my father, and uh, I argued, no, no, it doesn't make any difference, it doesn't make any Of course, what happened was, somehow, in the mix of things, I went to the University of Nebraska, where he wanted me to go all along. Mm -hmm. And it was, in this particular case, he was right. Uh, I, I would not have done, I, it's totally unlikely that I, I would have done anything like what I did do, some of which is okay. I thought it was about something else. I might have been something better. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But my, my whole course of uh, interest in 
what I'd be interested in has has changed. And I wouldn't have the same life. And I wouldn't have the same grandchildren. Mm. I wouldn't have the same life and grand well not life. But it wouldn't have the same grandchildren problems. Mm. And children problems and grandchildren problems. No. That's also talk then, because I'm sure things are quite different. I think about how you did come to meet your wife. First off, what was dating like back then, and how is it different from what it is today? Well, you certainly you certainly didn't sleep together on the first date. <laughs> In fact, you didn't sleep together on the second or third date. In fact, you didn't sleep together until you were married. That sounds like a good idea, actually. I think it's a very good idea, and. So far as I know, at least two of my children, that's a four of them, at least two of my children lived by that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, today, it's, it's, you know, it's very, very difficult for a Christian family to maintain that without somehow making children feel that they're too different from their friends. Yep. Social pressure is an incredibly powerful thing, mm -hmm. an incredibly powerful factor in his apologetics as well. Mm -hmm. If you have been brought up in a particular environment, a particular take on life, and the Christian faith in its at its heart mm -hmm. contradicts that or puts it under judgment, it's very difficult to accept it. I think that's one of the reasons, one of the kinds of reasons that some of my friends who do not uh, have uh, what I would call centrally Christian beliefs or beliefs which are set Centrally Christian enough to call Christian. Uh, a lot of it has to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when it, it just amazes me how much things have changed. When I was dating my wife, we actually lived about 200 to 250 miles apart. And so when the time came for me to take her to meet my parents, where well, we kind of had to stay somewhere, and it, my parents had two separate bedrooms there, and so what I did then was think, you know, I'm going to make sure everything's good. So I emailed her dad beforehand, laid out what all the arrangements would be, said my parents are going to be there, we're not going to let, they're not going to let us out of their sight pretty much, make sure nothing's going to happen, I'm going to make sure I honor your daughter because you know what my commitment is beforehand, and I know I'm taking her out of state, and she'll be way overnight and I want to make sure I have your blessing in this that you're fine with it. He said, you're very honorable, take good care of her. And <laughs> when it came time for me to propose, before I said anything to Allie about it, I called her parents beforehand and said, yeah, you know I've been dating Allie for so long and I'd like to propose to her and I want your blessing. And I suspect a lot of guys, sadly, don't do that kind of thing anymore. One of my grandsons did. Good I'm for sorry, him. One, I'm sorry. One of my, my son-in-law did that. I think the other one did as well. I don't remember that as much as I do. Uh, <laughs> Lord married my oldest daughter after my youngest daughter. <laughs> but in any case, you're right. That whole business of uh, marriage is... A, sacred, and B, social, and C, mm. family. Mm. But that could be just written up. They just, well, for a time. Yeah, the, the, the sacredness of marriage and sexuality seems to be at an all-time low in our culture. And it, it really amazes me when I argue with atheists and say, like, I'm the one who's saying, this is something good, this is wonderful, this is a treasure, we need to honor it and put it in its proper place, and you're saying I treat this in a cheap way? Yeah, it, it's just the opposite way. Exactly, exactly. Uh, anyway, that's hmm. enough on that, okay? <laughs> you, you know, something that did surprise me also, Red, is that the, when you... Uh, I'm going to let my wife get that. Okay. Something that did surprise me also is that when I read about how you and Marjorie did get married, that you proposed to her after just a few weeks, didn't you? I did. I did. I, uh, <laughs> she had actually seen me, quote unquote, in an uh, admirable light. Mm -hmm. A little before I had seen her, mm -hmm. uh, she uh, had gone great pains 
she'd gone to Concord, in Colorado, having taken a public transportation from North Dakota, which took her to uh, Minneapolis and I think uh, to Des Moines and Omaha. And <laughs> by the time she got to the Concord, the aircraft ran to the university place in mm -hmm. Colorado, she was quite ill. But she got well enough so that on one of the little trips, out trips we took, uh, she, she saw me, I had a little Tyrol on top on, uh, there in the mountains, and she had her first sense of me. I, I think I liked mm -hmm. <laughs> At the same time, I had two people I wanted to date. I had her and another person. I dated the other person. Okay, but nothing wonderful. And then I started dating Marge, and it was, you know, the experience was absolutely marvelous and brand new and striking mm. and older than life. Yeah, I mean, I read that you proposed after a few weeks. See, I proposed to Allie after about, oh, three months' time. I was thinking, wow, someone who moved actually faster than I did. <laughs> you couldn't move any faster. <laughs> now, it was, now you, you all did get married, of course, and if you don't mind my asking, how long have you all been married now? Uh, let's see, it'll be 59 years. 59? 59, I think, it, yeah, it would be 59. Mm -hmm. Wow, congratulations. Now, it was shortly after you got married, though, that you entered what I think you would say is the worst period of your life, probably. And that would be military service. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that, Sam. Well, the, the worst thing about it was I wasn't really in contact, uh, personal contact, with very many people who were obviously Christians. Mm-hmm. And in Korea, there was no, uh, there, was, there was a chapel, but it was out of reach for me, that even though I was an officer, um, even though I was an officer, the, uh, I couldn't get a jeep when I really would like to have had one. And so that was missing. Mm. And that, that, my, that part of life was Mm -hmm. Secondly, I never really liked being in Korea. I, I didn't mind being in Korea because it was fun. I minded being in Korea because Marge wasn't with me. Mm -hmm. If Marge had been with me and we'd been, I'd been serving in the military together, that would have been much, much better. Mm -hmm. I had the advantage, however, of being late, if you will, later than my colleagues, getting into to Korea because I was held back to be a courier officer in Japan for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, I got assigned to the headquarters, and that, of course, is a much better place to be than out in the out in the units of the, of the field. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I did not have to be in command of anything. The second lieutenant, or the second officer, and the two officer unit called called the uh, company. Mm -hmm. I would have been off. Mm -hmm. I'm not. A, I'm not a commander. I'm not. A, I'm not a manager. Mm -hmm. I've managed, but I managed to manage somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that you know you're opposed to military. or just that it wasn't for you, right? No, no. I so I had. I didn't think the military was a very good place to be. Somebody told me, sure. This is a peacetime. This is a peacetime army. Mm -hmm. When you get it, when, when you have something to do, things fit. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's true. And I honor, I honor our military like you wouldn't imagine. Uh, I, I weep for them, I pray for them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They're not, the ones that I'm, <laughs> I'm really, really concerned for are the ones that are out there because they're commanded to be, they have to be. They're mm -hmm. the, the, the hands and feet of the mm -hmm. peace force. No, this was in the Korean War that you served, right? I was out right after the Korean War. Korean okay. War was over. Mm. Uh, this is 1956, mm. uh, and I was there 16 months. I came back in early 1957, mm. June 1957. Now, one of the other things you also did like that was you found that you were pretty much expendable to them, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I thought I had a job that when I got ill just before I came back. That uh, before they shipped me out, somebody would come and debrief me. They never came. I wasn't debriefed. I 
specifically, the military can keep you around and do it quite well without me. Mm hmm Yeah. Good, well, learn, good lesson to learn. Yeah. Now, when you got back, however, you did get a blessing other than seeing Marjorie, of course, and that was University Fellowship, right? Yes, I had been a member when I was an undergraduate, and so getting back to a university where there was an university, a Christian fellowship, I immediately had found it, found it at, at uh, Washington State University and was a, what you would call a grad student volunteer uh, advisor. Mm -hmm. kind of you know, this might surprise some people about your mind that you're you've got a degree in English, but your writing your spelling can sometimes be horrible to this day, and you have to have and your wife really helps go over what you write, and I'm sure there's a lot of red at the end, isn't there? Well, don't don't make my spelling too bad. <laughs> it's not too bad. It's just. <sighs> Uh, it's just sometimes bad. Mm. <laughs> but bad enough so I don't want to send it out without mm. having someone else look, look over it and, and do something to it. And that's what she was able to do with my graduate papers. Mm. If, my, what, if my graduate papers had been like my undergraduate papers, I might have gotten, mm. and if I did, undergraduate, I got good grades. Mm. But uh, there were, there were, uh, Apparently, the spelling and occasional punctuation and grammar were not uh, considered quite so important as my understanding of what I was writing about. Yeah, I, I was very relieved to find out that some papers you got, apparently the professors weren't too thrilled with what no, you yeah, said. No, no, that's freshman or sophomore, yeah, that's right. Now, you are... You were willing to keep a toe in the academic field as much as you could, being a professor and such, but you also got the chance to be the editor for InterVarsity, right? Uh, right. Never intended. Mm hmm So, what exactly happened? Well, I was, uh, when I got, when I worked my graduate degree for six years at the University of Missouri, uh, when I arrived on campus, the university chapter had two people left in it, the president mm -hmm. and the secretary. Uh, it took me a couple of weeks to find where they were, uh, and uh, then we, we, I met with them, and it took those two people and some other graduate uh, students who were former university people, mm -hmm. and we decided whether there would even be a chapter. I forced them to vote, the two of them to vote what <laughs> they wanted to continue their chapter. Mm -hmm. And they were two Presbyterians, and the options were to go to a Baptist uh, place, and so there was no difficulty. They voted. <laughs> unanimously to keep the chapter going. Mm -hmm. So I became their, and they had just lost their uh, their sponsor. So mm -hmm. I became their sponsor immediately. Uh, and uh, we had a couple of years later, a half a dozen or more, and eventually got a staff member. And the group grew, grew into a viable university group over those six years. And in this process, while you've been at the university, you've been writing a lot of books. Uh, what books do you think been the ones that you've kind of taken the most pride in writing. <laughs> well, the most, both the most pride and the most, uh, and the most uh, surprise. Uh -huh. And that was the book you mentioned, The Universe Next Door. Right. That can, there, there are a lot of reasons why that book succeeded, for, as some of the other things I've done have not done so well, uh, is that it came at exactly the right time in the, in the uh, American Christian and evangelical culture. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Schaeffer had been writing, and I'd just become his editor. Um, his book, Francis Schaeffer's book, had become successful, successful. He was one of the first evangelical scholar, pastors, evangelists to speak university language to university students such mm -hmm. that there was a, a, that they had a real ministry to university students. First of all, the university students that would end up in the green, where he had his retreat uh, center, mm -hmm. and, and the family and so forth. And secondly, because what he lectured, he lectured the university groups all over the country and was highly successful in attracting an audience. 
and the churches began to catch on. Evangelical churches began to catch on across mainline broad denominations as well as the, as the broad, broad evangelical churches. Well, my book was a distillation, in a sense, in one sense it was, it was brand new. In another sense, it was a distillation of the attitude that Schaefer took toward the understanding of culture. What mm -hmm. Schaefer did was to speak to people whose minds were set up early with a university mold and needed to be addressed with a university mold. Mm -hmm. And that university mold uh, uh, was in the shape of naturalism and of uh, various and sundry religions into which students had, had gotten involved. So uh, he, uh, he had, and he stood in a tradition of worldview analysis mm -hmm. as well. So I took up, uh, not knowing really what I was doing in terms of what, it, what effect it would have on the uh, future of worldview thought, I just did a basic book for undergraduate students. It was not intended to be anything other than that, uh, to help a student coming from the Christian world, some a mainline or evangelical, getting into the university, and suddenly discovering that the teachers seem to be talking from uh, a point of view they couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, they mentioned the Bible. The Bible didn't seem to have any bearing. Now, in my day, you usually were not criticized for that. But, uh, and put down for that. Today you are. It's yep. worse today. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, this book addressed that, that situation. Mm -hmm. The Bible that was published, 1976. I'd been in university press for six years by that time, mm -hmm. eight years by that time. Mm -hmm. And the one that was getting got picked up as a textbook by Christian colleges and Christian professors at secular colleges mm -hmm. for the introduction to philosophy or to, in some cases, they, one of the first books students would read once they got into the uh, university. That was the case in Covenant College in, in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was, that was the book that really did it, and I was always interested in having a voice on the university campus. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this became my voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it he, he got me back on campus. I had, uh, I had left campus in 1968 when I became an editor, being invited to be an editor, not seeking the job at all. Uh, I had to leave something that I thought God was calling me to. Mm -hmm. I realized that he was calling me to something else. Mm -hmm. And doing so, I had to possibly abandon much of my university ministry. Well, what happened? I, I became an editor, and then I felt the impact on the university. So, win win. But that's why that book, among other reasons, that's why that book was the one that both pleases me and that what had happened surprised me and continues to surprise me. You talked about having a voice somewhere. In one place, I was surprised to hear the impact your voice was having when you talked about it on a personal level was over in the Eastern Bloc in Europe. Could you tell a little bit about what it was like getting to speak over there and how you were received and what impact Christianity is having over there? That too was a surprise. Mm -hmm. One surprise was to find out where Bulgaria was. I got a call from one of my friends in the, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, which is the umbrella organization that sort of ties together a lot of movements in a lot of countries. I got a, a, a telephone call from him, and he said, would you like to come to Bulgaria? That was 19, mm -hmm. 1990, I think, spring of 1990, or 91, 91. I got my first reaction to Bulgaria, Bulgaria. Where's Bulgaria? But well, there is that, 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 that country that Shakespeare has a border with a base or with a, a black sea on. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, I learned what, what Bulgaria was and uh, said yes. And I just got introduced to an entirely different world. Mm -hmm. Oh, 1991 was, I think, my first trip, or 92, my first trip into mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And I went to several countries at the time. I went pretty much after that, every spring and every fall, 
uh, I would take a two or three week stint in uh, Eastern Europe. And, and, and when I got there the first time, some of these places, I was the first person, the first Christian, not just any Christian, the first Christian mm -hmm. to speak at some of these universities, mm -hmm. like the Klimarinsky University in, in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, and it was easy. If you put up a little sign and a, 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 a tight, tight sign on a door somewhere in the university saying, you know, such and such was going to happen in a place that, uh, some place, you get, a, you get a group of students there. Because they were, they were hungry for something other than the, the communist ideology that they had been under. They knew that was wrong. They mm -hmm. knew that. Well, I, I've got professors who, who told me, this is a professor in, uh, in Romania, in Yash, Romania. He said, when I was, uh, for 40 years I taught lines. But it turns out he, it, he is and continued to be during that time some kind of Russian Orthodox first, uh, I should say, Eastern Orthodox person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was doing. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, well, I didn't know their names, I couldn't know their names, and I couldn't teach them what I thought. So we began to talk about Vaslav Pavel, who is uh, non-Christian, but very, very much uh, ethically oriented, and I want to say almost Christian, president at that time of Czech, in the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, I was supposed to find out whether it was whether this professor was really a Christian or not, from the group I was with. Mm. And so I asked him, I made a comment, I said, you know, one of the things we, uh, that was interesting to me is how Pavel integrated with political uh, justice and with, uh, from a, a non-Christian standpoint, that he does everything but notice that the Final being in the universe is not just impersonal, it's really the Christian God. Mm -hmm. And the professor said that Pavel oh, is just on the table and he said, Yes, yes, heart God. Mm -hmm. So we continued our discussion and afterwards I told the students, said, Well, I'm not exactly sure where he stands, but I treat him as if he's a Christian mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and listened to him and talked with him and so forth. Turns out he really was a Christian. Mm. And he became involved, not with the Baptist Church, which was quite active in the at that time, but uh, in the Orthodox Church. Mm. Now, I was also very surprised to read a comment that one of the professors told you that the professors over there were scared to face the Christian philosophy from the West because it was so very good. Well, this was at the uh, University of Yudash. In, in Romania also. And uh, that's what I was told. Mm -hmm. but they noticed after we were finished, we had a, had a group of faculty there. None of them from the philosophy department. Mm -hmm. And the comment was, they're not here because they know that they don't have an answer for a serious Christian philosophy. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to come. Now, it's been a long, long time since you've... Uh, since the start where we talk about being in the Sand Hills and such, uh, when was the last time you went back to the Sand Hills? Uh, last time I went back to uh, Eastern Europe? To the Sand Hills. Oh, the Sand Hills. Uh, well, uh, off and on throughout my life. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we could, uh, my parents lived still on the river of Sand Hills and we would drive there. Christ, family, the family, uh, I was teaching at the Glasgow Western. Mm -hmm. And then, how about, after I moved to Chicago, it was a lot less, but it, many times when I was back, at least they get a, a taste or smell of, it, of the wind, if not the fall of itself. But uh, in the last few years, Marge and I have had a chance to spend some vacations there. Mm -hmm. A week or two. Mm -hmm. How different? 
of a sand hills now from when you were growing up there? Well, certainly as a, as a place to be, no difference at all. For one thing, there are so few people there that were, the land doesn't change mm -hmm. much. Uh, culture, climate mm -hmm. changes and so forth, but the land doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So you still have the same sense and feeling of God's creation. Mm -hmm. A lot of it uh, untouched in terms, mm -hmm. I should say, un not altered much by human uh, occupation. The way in which the land is treated is, of course, much more modern. Mm -hmm. There are very few places where we saw recently, uh, our last trip there, where we saw any haste being stacked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was all bales, but instead of those heavy 100 plus pound bales of hay, there were huge, multi, multi hundred pounds rolls of which fortunately for human beings cannot be lifted by a human being, mm -hmm. so must be transported, transported mm -hmm. by uh, other machine. Mm -hmm. So it's easier work in some ways in mm -hmm. that sense. The machines have replaced a lot of a, a lot of hand on hands on mm -hmm. work. But that's about all. Mm -hmm. the, the Nebraska's the fabric of Nebraska were always educated. The, uh, from the very beginning, education was high on the list of what the, the immigrants wanted. The University of Nebraska has been announced since 1868, Nebraska West End since 1890, 1889, and uh, there are several other small colleges and, mm. and, and state colleges around the state. So it's an educated place. Mm. You, don't, you, know, you talk about, we'll talk about country hicks. Mm -hmm. But they're educated country kids. Sure, they're country. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of difference between a country person and a rural person mm -hmm. in terms of what counts as work. Uh, I, think the, I think country votes character. I, I wish some of our kids and grandkids could have had the characters built by mm -hmm. country work. Yep. Not enough for them to do in Downers Grove mm -hmm. or downtown Chicago mm -hmm. or in the mm -hmm. suburbs, either one. Yeah, if you could. Uh go back in time somehow and meet your younger self from where you are now, what's the one piece of wisdom you wish you could pass on? I don't know that I have any wisdom. <laughs> I, I, really have, I really haven't changed my mind radically. Mm -hmm. I think I've grown up. I think I have a, a, you know, a, a greater stock of ideas, a, mm -hmm. a greater stock of how to treat those ideas. But Mostly, when I talk to kids, I just tell them to think, be educated, ask questions, mm -hmm. and uh, move ahead. Mm -hmm. and that, that counts for somebody born in the river of the sand hills as well as someone born in the, I, in the what shall I say, the, uh, the, the rich high rises of New York. Yeah, I remember uh, going back to my old high school one time and after I had graduated from college, you know, thinking, going to my old high school journalism class, and, because the teacher had really liked me, and told the kid, and she said, what would you advise the kids? And I said, honestly, kids, um, your teacher isn't putting me up to say this. She doesn't know what I'm saying, but I'm going to tell you that anyway. Read. Read anything that you can. Yep, yep. Mm. Yes. Well, how do you get to think? Exactly. Uh, reading other people's thoughts, and Rethinking them. Yep. And maybe rejecting them. Now, when we look at some of your other books, such as The Projects Beyond Reason, you make quite a case from an argument from Kraft and Traselli. Well, it's not musical for you. You change it to another to your kind of language. But it's the argument they gave that the music of Bach exists. Therefore, God exists. And their explanation is, you either see this or you don't. What do you see when you see that argument? Well, my first uh, response when I saw it, I saw it uh, when the book was published, it must have been 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But, oh my goodness, that's funny. Uh, but actually, it's, 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 it's not an old argument. It's an, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a new argument. It's an old argument. Yep. It's the argument from aesthetics. Uh huh. Uh, and Bach's music plays, there's something really glorious that's happened mm -hmm. to the sound. Yep. 
something that's glorious has happened to melody, mm -hmm. to rhythm. Uh, what never never happened that way before. A box version of the Baroque. You, you, you take the Baroque form to the heights of its uh, to the heights. You, you can't get any higher. You got to have a new form, mm -hmm. <laughs> which of course you do. Mm -hmm. Music is historical as well. And the argument I would want to say there is the music of Beethoven. Mm -hmm. And there's the music of uh, uh, Dave, Dave Luba. Mm -hmm. And the sound of the music of Paul Desmond. Mm -hmm. uh, and the crazy, weird stuff of, uh, of uh, I can't think of it by them. Uh, but anyway, with the beat in the uh, post Dave Brubeck era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was in seminary at Shuri Summer, I wrote a paper on Thomas Aquinas and his views of beauty and beauty as a pointer to God. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. and what you talk about in your book is the idea that everything that exists is a pointer to God in some way. And it's reminds me of what Peter Kraft said also in his book, Heaven the Heart's Deepest Song, where he said, everything that you see here is either a, a clue to what heaven is like or to what hell is like. Ah, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would, I, would, I would go around with that. But, mm -hmm. you see, this is another version of the argument from evil. Mm -hmm. And if there is such a thing as evil, then there is got to be some measure by which evil is evil. Mm -hmm. Evil, uh, evil doesn't have a goal. Mm -hmm. Evil is just, I, I don't know how you describe it, it's, it's something that it's uh, a lack. a mentally constructed person is going to see yeah. as really, really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely difficult, for instance, to see how ISIS could be so evil. And how does ISIS point to God? Right. Well, ISIS points to God if, because it, it, there's a necessity for at least a, a possibility of hell. Mm -hmm. Because you've got a realization of what hell would be like right here on Earth mm -hmm. in a way that cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. But right in front of your right in front of your, the parents' children are beheaded. Mm -hmm. How? Not only do the parents feel this, mm -hmm. but the people who hear about it on television are Mm-hmm. Not in the same sense, but they recognize this as a horror, and they are sometimes, you might say, scared to death that something like that is going to happen in, in, in their culture, our culture. Yeah. Uh, look what's going on. Are we going to reach a place where we are so pluralistic in our society that we can no longer live with our deepest differences, and we're going to be taking care of that through violence? Mm -hmm. uh, that can't be. Well, if that can't be, and if there has to be a good, what explains the good? Right. Evil can be explained by a denial of the good. In other words, there has to be a good mm -hmm. in order, order for evil to exist. Otherwise, evil and good, you'd be a total nihilist. Mm -hmm. If you don't difference between evil and good. And that would violate, and that would violate, I think, everyone sense mm -hmm. of what must be. Even the evil person thinks they're good. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine the people who flew their planes into the buildings in New York were not thinking that they were honoring the good, honoring God, mm -hmm. following Him in order to do that. And they were going to be rewarded for it. Yeah. They would now be martyred for the cause of God. So the good there's the, even they had a notion of the good, part of which was very personal. They get to be, uh, they get to, to to have some kind of paradise. Mm. You know, I'd even, I'd even go a little bit further for what you were saying. That you were saying that there would be no difference between good and evil. I'd even say the terms good and evil would just be meaningless at that <laughs> point. It's just personal preference. That's right. Yeah. And, and persons are different. Yeah. 
In fact, Osama Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Someone once said, I remember who it was, I read years ago, someone said that we should award Hitler an honorary degree in theology because he showed us all how much we need God. Oh, that's kind of a horror analogy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, people like that are you know, actions like his. Mm-hmm. They write, what you want to they write in the sand. They write in the sand, despite themselves. Yeah. I think G.K. Chesterton said years ago in his book Orthodoxy that when you see two boys skinning a cat for the fun of it, you can either deny original sin or you can deny good and evil. He said some modern theologians choose instead to deny the cat. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Just as I always did put things on <laughs> better than anyone did the rest of it. Yeah, I'm sure in all your reading you've read plenty of Chesterton. And he, Quite a bit. Yeah, but... I, I, when I was living with a roommate, once uh, he was, he's into a project like I am, and he uh, wanted to borrow my copy of the complete Father Brown mysteries, and he told me one night, that, uh, right, he told me the next day that he'd gone to bed that night, and he was going to read one of the mysteries, and then go to sleep, so I was up for two or three hours reading those mysteries. <laughs> But he couldn't put him down. Now, when you talk about the uh, projects beyond reason, what you're pointing to is a transcendence in that. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, let's, go, let's, let's go back to theology. Okay. You, God is said to be both imminent and transcendent. Right. Most things are not in the Bible. Right. When you get to you try to figure out at least the least theological point, point of looking at the at the uh, what if you use more philosophic language, mm-hmm. God is both limited in His creation and He is transcendent over His creation. God is is and always is and always was. And Gottlieb's question is, where did God come from? What caused God is just foolish. Yep. Because the point is that God is what is, mm-hmm. and everything else is what He has made. Right. So, um, but if God has made it, is God absent from it? No, He isn't. He's present to it all the time. He upholds mm-hmm. the universe by His will of power. Right. So, where is God? Uh, he's God to my computer. He's in your image. He's in my image. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are in the image of God. Uh, even even the universe is, bears marks of His. Of, of who he is. Mm-hmm. First of all, there is there's marks that he is existent. He, he, he exists, but mm-hmm. he exists eternally, completely, totally, mm-hmm. uh, absolutely, whereas we live finitely, right. uh, partially, mm-hmm. not all the time. We are not immortal. Uh, we, we, it's creation. Whatever shape, form we are in, we are always in, connected with him. Mm-hmm. So what the secret of transcendence does is gives us, since most of us just live in the imminent world, for the most part, live in a world which we can understand by our normal senses and our normal reason, uh, a signal transcendence appears to us when the world itself cannot be, cannot be adequately understood in material terms. Mm-hmm. An illustration I use in, in Echoes of the Voice, Cascade book, is this a siren? Uh, uh, I hear a siren. I look out my window, which I can do right now. I look out my window and I see a ambulance going by. Now, when I hear the siren, I don't think I've heard the siren. I know I've heard the siren, but what I'm interested in is what does that siren mean? Right. Well, it means in general some kind of danger. Mm-hmm. Get out of the way, we're coming through. It suggests maybe there's a death. It suggests maybe there's a tornado. Uh, it's 
But each of these things is a further transcendence of the immediate siren. Even the fact that it's a siren and not just sound is a bit of transcendence. Yep. But when you, when you realize that that sound, that siren, that death, that, that danger, none of those can be understood in and of themselves. They're not, they're not self-explanatory. They're only there because they are in some sort of being or becoming. Mm -hmm. Material being is always becoming. Right. Uh, and, and so it's, mm -hmm. the first God is no longer becoming the presence of God that it is. Mm -hmm. So that's what a called signal transcendence, because of the whole range of almost anything mm -hmm. you can do that. From the music of Bach, the magnificence of a really good computer that always, <laughs> always obeys your will and, and doesn't get hacked. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a dream. <laughs> you get hacked? Um. I've, my wife, I think, has been hacked a few times, but I'm morphing also the idea of a computer that always obeys your will more than the one that I'm constantly having to realize is testing my anger, considering I'm saying, do what you're supposed to do already. But that has to do with what you're doing with your fingers. Right. You know, I mean, it's not what, the, it's not what my fingers say, it's what I want my fingers to do mm -hmm. that will make the computer do what it does. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the computer's not going to think for you. That's another very interesting yep. uh, subject in terms of apologetics. And I and my uh, atheist friend, who, with whom I've written a book, Carl, Carl Ferreno, mm -hmm. Carl and I argue about whether uh, the human being is totally a machine, and whether it's a computer or some other kind of machine. Yeah, he says that everything is a, everything is a machine. Mm -hmm. But this machine that we're working on now, pretty well, all the all technology that allows to be Skype as well as uh, uh, email and so forth, that couldn't be without some kind of, uh, something else of supporting it. Mm -hmm. A designer, someone who puts it together, someone who understands how, right. what I think, how computers work. Mm -hmm. My son is a you know, programmer for a state farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He understands more than I do, and he doesn't understand uh, a lot of stuff either. So. We're, we're about an hour into our show, so we're going to take a little break from the conversation here, and we'll let everyone know that uh, if you're liking what I've got going on right now, we've got Dr. James Sire as our guest this week. You can, but if you're listening in next week, I'm going to have Graham Veer. As my guest. Now, he's written a book about the new atheism and a survivor's guide to the new atheism. We're going to be talking with him about that. We're going to be having a show an hour early that day, so if you're listening to it live, then you need to be here at 2, uh, at two to 4 p.m. Eastern Time instead of the usual 3 to 5. And yes, we are going to be working on going live, and hopefully someday we'll get back to the point where we can have callers calling in to the show again, but Grand View is going to be here. We're going to be talking about things such as is there a conflict between religion and science and even about monsters made out of spaghetti. You know, some of you know what I'm talking about with that, but it's going to be an interesting show. <coughs> I'd like to remind you all also, and that some of you are first time listeners through the Universal Pentecostal Network, that everything that I do here is supported by you. I get no pay for doing the show. No one hires me to do the show. It's just something that I do in my own free will as a service to you all. But your support would be greatly appreciated. I don't pay my guests. Even my guests come on and give a very free time. But if you want to support it, what I'm doing here, which is the Ministry of Deeper Waters, Go to deeperwaters.wordpress.com. That's my blog. You'll find a link there that will tell you how to donate. And you, by the way, you'll also find a link for several past archives of the show. So you can listen in to past programs, see what all you've missed. And there was quite a lot to keep you busy there for a while. But you click on the donate button, and that will take you to Risen Jesus Ministries. Now, that's the ministry of my father-in-law, Mike Sakona. And you make a, a donation there, and then, very important, you email either me 
or him. And my email is listed on the blog page as well. You email one of us and say, Hey, I made a donation to Nick Peters. I made a donation to Deeper Waters. And I want to make sure he gets it. Now, if you do that, then yes, we will get it. And Risen Jesus is a 501c3. So that means your gift will be tax deductible. You can get a receipt for your gift. Everything you need for your tax purposes can be provided for. <laughs> now, we've also got some ebooks out there as well. Once I've written with my ministry partner, the latest one I've written with him is Defining Inerrancy. I encourage you all to read that if you want to pay attention to the Inerrancy debate, especially the one that does involve Mike Vakona and how he's been unfairly targeted in many cases. But uh, there's another ebook <coughs> that's also coming out. And that's uh, God in Natural Disasters. I believe that's the title we've chosen for it now. Dr. Sire here talked about writing a book with an atheist where it's a back and forth dialogue. Well, that's pretty much what happened here. It was an atheist who does some work with Dan Barker. And he and I had a long back and forth on whether natural disasters are a disproof of the existence of God. As you can guess, my answer is no. But that book will be coming out. I think we're going to sell it for seven fifty. dollars I, I encourage you to get in. Leave positive reviews. And by the way, keep in mind, this podcast can be found on iTunes as well. And I would really appreciate you going to the iTunes page and leaving a positive review for the Deeper Waters podcast there as well. And there's still yet another way that you can support what we're doing here for ministry. And that's when you go to my blog page, you can find an Amazon store. And at the Amazon store, there are listed a various books, including ones that you hear about on the podcast, and yes, I still need to do some updating of that with the girl last one then, but you know, if you're going to go and you're going to buy the books, why not buy them in a way that it won't cost you any more money, and a small amount of the proceeds will go to support the Ministry of Deeper Waters. You can find all of this from my blog page. There. And, and I just say this a lot because I really encourage you to give. It's the best way that you can keep the ministry going, and I would really appreciate your support. And, now, Dr. Sire, I've spent some time talking about Deeper Waters here and how people can support it. Is there any ministry or organization you'd like people to support as well? Well, the one that I give most of my support to, except in my local church, is InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in right. Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they uh, are a ministry on campus, and they, uh, <laughs> if you like my books, you'll like InterVarsity. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say if you don't like my books, you won't like InterVarsity. That's another argument. <laughs> right. And InterVarsity is, I, I owe them a debt of gratitude for everything that they've done here. The reason that you're on the show is because they sent me a copy of your book and they got in touch with you, so you got in touch with me. And they've sent a number of books for me to review and they, they've really been nothing but friendly throughout the whole process. You're one of the marketers. <laughs> Uh, although I will say I'm quite sure my wife panics every time she I come back from the post office and there's another book and she's saying, where are we going to keep all of your books? Well, do like I had to do. I built a two and a half car garage. And the second floor, I, I thought of the building. Mm -hmm. I saw the second floor he put in um, bookcases around the edges. You mm -hmm. got to try that. Maybe I can ask you. I, my, I, I'm exhausted pretty much the space is up there now. Yeah, I may be young, but I'm no physical specimen. I think my wife would be even more concerned about my trying to build something here. <laughs> that, 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 that's another funny story. I'll have to tell you about that another time. But let's get back to what you were talking about. When you were describing this transcendence, I couldn't help but think of uh, C.S. Lewis with his things such as The Argument from Desire and Surprise by Joy where he talks about how you have these rare movements, I think he calls them Zangzooks, 
something like that. You probably know exactly what word he uses. But it's that you get a, a signal of that there's something greater than what you've experienced right now. And the desire you experience at that point is actually a good desire. And you enjoy the desire itself. And it's not something you can wear. It just happens. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? Mm. Uh, yes, I think that when, when you're searching, when you're looking for something, when you're when, there's, uh, uh, when you're open, maybe that's the best way to put it. Mm. When you're open to possibility, when you realize intellectually that you live in God's world, then you can expect mm. these kinds of senses of desire, of, of which you know you want to know more of this. <laughs> This universe, more of the creator who created it. And when you find out that this is also a creator who has come into the earth, become human, his transcendence has become right. imminent. And or the transcendence has become imminent and shown us more of who God really is than we've been able to get from the hints and signals. Well, Jesus is the, he is the thing itself. Mm-hmm. He's the really real. Uh, and his message is about that and shows us to me that. that's what we have to see in him since we do not see him in the flesh but we know he is been but before we even hear about Jesus perchance what we can do is we can look at our world and we can see that we can be like the little children on Christmas morning who open all of our gifts and at the end say there's got to be more than this <laughs> well, and when they when they ask them about three or four weeks later whether they got what they wanted, mm-hmm. well, I thought I wanted a bike, but I really wa- <laughs> yeah. I really wanted a baseball bat or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't get the baseball bat; they got the bike. It's uh, yes, desire goes both ways. Desire mm-hmm. can it's not always to be fulfilled. Uh, how different that is from what you get in Buddhism. Mm-hmm. In Buddhism, you want to get rid of desire. Right. Desire is what, what desire and the, and the satisfaction of desire is what makes life utterly miserable. Mm-hmm. And that can be true. And I think, I think in many ways, the overly rich in our world often come to a place where there isn't anything more they can buy. But will satisfy them. They've got everything they want. What do I do now? They're not always happy, happy campers, especially those those campers who are sons and daughters of the really, really wealthy. Uh, one of my friends said the difference between wealth and, uh, and uh, being comfortable, wealthy, you don't sleep a few million dollars and make you wealthy, but you don't get comfortable and you have several billion. <laughs> Yeah, I... Some people who are billionaires are not comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember reading, I think it was a quote from Happiness is a Choice. You know, it was written by Christians. We talk about uh, counseling people <clears throat> who live a rich life. So I was like, I've got a great job. I make a lot of money. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got a mistress on the side. I've got cars, I've got everything I've ever wanted, and I keep asking myself, why don't I just go ahead and just kill myself? I'm and that, that, that's a very real reality, because it's it the, the old thing that someone once said, I wish I'd known that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. <laughs> now, for you, you find a lot of these echoes of, of voice as you get the thing from N.T. Wright. I think it is. Yeah, N.T. Wright calls these echoes, uh, calls these because of transcendence, echoes of a voice, mm-hmm. echoes of the voice of Jesus. Yep. So that when you when you're catching this beautiful mountain scenery, that's God. The echo, that's God. He spoke it. He spoke that into existence. Mm-hmm. And here's the echo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. Yeah, around here for me, it, it counts as automatically awesome once you refer to N.T. Wright as your source. That when you uh, see these echoes, for you, a lot of them seem to take place in literature. 
Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking that, uh, for instance, it, it could depend a lot on your fear since literature is your area. My wife happens to be an artist, so I'm sure she'd see a lot of the, uh, hear a lot of the echoes of the voice if we went to, say, an art museum. For instance, and we go to a painting and chances are she, oh, isn't that just beautiful? And I'd look and say, mm, that's nice. That'd be me. <laughs> but, you know, when I, I say literature, some people are saying, oh, you just mean the Bible and Christian literature. And, and that's where you get all your echoes. But you find echoes everywhere in literature, don't you? Absolutely. And it could be Virginia Woolf at her most anti-Christian. Mm-hmm. Well, the very fact that she can write in such a way that you're impressed by her expression, impressed by what she understands, mm -hmm. and impressed by her self-understanding, and her ability to, to express that, you are you're witnessing the work of God. Yep. Yeah. Being, being used, and in this particular case, being misused. Mm -hmm. But it's there. Yep. You know, you're talking about Virginia Woolf, who was, in fact, not only non-Christian, but we'd even say she was anti-Christian. She but, was, yes. But she how, actually came out against, uh, against uh, Christianity. Yeah. And there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Dawkins is anti-Christian. Yeah. A lot of scientists are atheists and to, to like, to uh, religious questions, agnostic. Mm -hmm. That is, their atheism doesn't lead them to say there's there's nothing else worth uh, worth believing. Right. But I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. This is for well, even Dawkins says that science makes uh, the uh, the lack of design show us by itself that we have no need for God. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at someone like Virginia Woolf, who who was anti-Christian, what what do you see in her literature that still points to Christianity anyway? Well, again, the artfulness of it, mm -hmm. uh, her ability to take a particular philosophic view and depict it, what the world would be like if mm -hmm. that was what we had to deal with. Mm -hmm. First, I, I think one of the one of her first books that succeeded was uh, Jacob's Room. Mm -hmm. Jacob's Room is a book about a boy who dies, a, a young man who dies in the war. And his story, and the story of his parents and the other characters in the, in the novel, are all told, not completely, because it's possible to do this completely, but at least the attempt is made throughout the novel, mm -hmm. not to say there's London. London lays like a, you know, like a, a, a lump on a big rug. Yeah, no, no. He's, she's not talking about London looking like that. She is talking about the London that is perceived. Mm. She talks about, uh, in the opening, in the opening of uh, Jacob's room, that she, the woman character she's observing, the character she's getting inside the mind of, is one who looks up and sees a, a yacht mast wobble. Well, yacht masts don't wobble. They lean, they tilt, that's a, but they don't wobble. But in, in, in her eyes, they wobble. Why? Because she's crying. Mm -hmm. And so you are, so much of the novel, as you read it, the lights went out in the garden. Mm -hmm. How did they go out in the garden? Because the light on the inside of the house was turned out. Mm -hmm. And so there was no longer any light coming to the to the be on the garden. So she says, the light went out of the garden. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, when you first start reading a Virginia Woolf novel, <laughs> you're really going to put it down pretty quickly, and you're going to say, well, and then you're going to figure out what she's doing. And after you're into it, uh, if you're willing to give yourself to it, after you're into it for a while, you're going to say, wow. This is brilliant. She has characters in one of her novels that have signals of transcendence, mm -hmm. but they end, they end in nothing. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm thinking that Mortimer Adler years ago wrote a book called How to Read a Book. When you got people out there who are hearing this and they're fascinating a bit, what advice would you give them for whenever they read literature if they're willing to try and figure out how to analyze it at this level? What would you recommend? Well, yeah, I'd recommend my own book, mm -hmm. which I wrote at the time of how to read a book had been published for a while, mm -hmm. and I deliberately didn't read it because I wanted to I wanted to do it my way, you know, <laughs> do it my way. After I had done my book, I read my other's book, and I said, gee, I'm glad I didn't read this beforehand. My book, however, is very different from his, but not contradictory. Except in a couple of cases, it's really not contradictory. It's just two, two ways of getting at much the same book. But I, my, the book I wrote was How to Read Slowly. Mm. Uh, came about through an actual historical, if you will, personal experience. I was teaching uh, English literature at the time at Trinity College in Deerfield. Mm -hmm. And I brought the chairman, a very young man, who had written a book, or really had a program called Speed Reading. He had a speed reading program. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of his students were taking that speed reading program. And then I got them in my classes. And they began to try to speed read the stuff I was teaching, and they, they, wouldn't, they were terrible readers. Mm -hmm. they, were, they might have been reading uh, according to, the, to my trust department chairman. So I said, I didn't tell him, but I just, he said, I was only working there part time anyway. I didn't tell him what I was doing, I just did it. I thought, when this book comes out, <laughs> he'll, he'll see it as, a, as an implicit criticism. But, uh, what you do is you use your mind and you look to see, in a sense, you look to see what is there in a sentence, just like a, a scientist looks to see, like Agassi of the fish, looks to see what's in the fish. Mm -hmm. Agassi used to give his students a fish, a Harvard professor a long time ago, and say, come back with a description of the fish. They'd come back with a description of the fish and he'd take it back again, do it again. Over and over and over and over. So finally, Angus will see, well, I think you understand the fish. But it's only by spending a lot of time looking, mm -hmm. observing, paying attention. So uh, but that's basically what, what I wanted you to do. You pay attention to the words, you pay attention to the subject, you pay attention to the paragraph, you pay attention to the structure, you pay attention to the imagery, mm -hmm. uh, and you pay, pay attention to the ideas. Mm -hmm. And the overall thing is to recognize. I guess I did do more of uh, in a little bit more explanation and apologetics beyond reason. You recognize that there is a world view mm -hmm. that is presented in a story, a mm -hmm. even a poem. Yesterday upon the stair I met a man who wasn't there. I met him there again today. Gee, I wish you'd go away. What picture of the world do you get there? It's a tiny little picture mm -hmm. about what's really real, what's not real, and what you feel. Mm -hmm. What kind of, you know, it's a very primitive world, but it's a world. And it takes place in something larger than the native clarity itself. It needs a larger world to understand. We understand it because we often feel like that. My goodness, I, I just see the ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. I keep having a really odd experiences. Mm -hmm. I wish I didn't have these odd experiences. I, I sometimes fear death. Right. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. What kind of a world, what kind of a world do you have those experiences? What's that shape? And is it, is it what's really there? Do you really die? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're made of just machinery. Uh, yeah, look, we will not know that we are dead. Mm -hmm. So if I worry about it. There's no we left. There's no I left. Yeah. Really? I think I tell the story of the, uh, of the primitive evangelism that was used on radio by the National Council of Churches oh, back in the 60s sometime, I think. The guy comes to the door and knocks, and the guy comes to the evangelist comes to the door and, and knocks, and, and the guy at the door says, uh, Hello, I'm Ron Jones. I am a, I'm a member of my family goes to the First Presbyterian Church, Downers Grove. 
Uh, we'd like to invite you to come there. You get coffee and uh, so forth, and here uh, have a good worship service and a lot of fellowship and friendship. Why don't you come? Well, we got come by and pick you up and take it. Yeah, he says, well, uh, next Sunday, uh, uh, I, I, I actually, I said, well, I can't do that. But what about this day after that? Well, uh, I'm coming out of town. I've got this, uh, uh, got this uh, job that I need to do. What about that? Well, after mm-hmm. he got about three weeks and he can't be there. And the fourth time, well, sure, come after that. The guy says, Gee, I might be dead by then. Mm-hmm. And the evangelist says, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The little story mm. was a frightening possibility. Right. You know, I'm remembering that I think it was after I took the class in Bible cars where we used the universe next door as one of the textbooks. You know, as a class think on worldview thinking, we were told after you gone through this class and studied worldviews, you will never watch a movie the exact same way again. And they've been right. And you and I've been watching a lot of things and Hmm, I wonder what perspective this offer is coming from, and just trying to find those little clues and such. It really enriches the way you see a movie or read a book or anything else, because you're really interacting with the author's mind a lot more, then. Not only that, you're interacting with the mind of the culture. Mm-hmm. A lot of the stuff you see on television, Mm-hmm. is a, uh, a darn near the perfect image of what life is actually really like. Mm-hmm. And I think of this uh, in terms of the difference between Ozzy and Harriet 40 years ago, or uh, Andy Griffith mm-hmm. Mayberry yeah. 40 years ago, and currently Law and Order, or uh, you, you name it, any other... Or, or even a comedy, any comedy, pretty much any comedy. And Norma Mayberry, of course, that was an idealized uh, society, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Almost ideal society. But it was, a, it was an ideal. Mm-hmm. Now look at today's ideal society in, uh, what, Two Men and a Boy or something like that. I've forgotten the name of it. Two and, and a Half Men. I don't watch it, but I, not because I think they're evil, but because I... <laughs> I do not enjoy them. Right. But what's the view that comes out? Well, nothing at all. Like it's okay to sleep with people. It's okay to have affairs that your husband or wife doesn't know about. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. There's no. There, by the way, there isn't any spiritual dimension at all. If anyone walks in who has some kind of religion, it's usually either ignored or mistreated. Mm-hmm. Now, once in a while, once in a while, you'll find a, a show. Uh, there was one uh, on the, an angel who got a, a, a black uh, woman and a white woman were angels. That was, that was actually pretty darn good. I think you're talking about touched by an angel. That's it, touched by an angel. That mm-hmm. was, that was really had a, a, a Christian context. Uh, not literally, mm-hmm. for chance. Ideologically, I think. Ideologically. But there are very, very few answers. Very, very few. Yeah, but at the same time, I think you, with your mentioning Virginia Woolf, you think it's important for us to not shield ourselves from me so much so that we only interact with and enjoy things from the Christian culture, that we need to be seeing what the non Christian culture is putting out there as well. Yeah, and a lot of it is to be enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it, some of it. <laughs> really nasty shows are terribly funny. Yep. <laughs> words so through. Terribly funny. Mm-hmm. At the same time. Right. Uh, Monty Python is <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite characters. <laughs> but uh, and very, very funny. But you don't get much of a Christian understanding of reality from, uh, from the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get slightly non-Christian. Yeah, I think uh, when my friends was teaching in an apologetics class and he was getting to a philosophical part of it, and I think he mentioned that he was going to open up by playing the Monty Python International Philosophy clip, which 
I'm I not. Suspect there's a, I suspect there's a book called The Philosophy of uh, Monty Python. I, uh, I, I, I think, think there is. Book. I think there is. There's a whole series. You've probably heard of the Pop Culture and Philosophy series. And I have not, actually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a Monty Python in philosophy. But I, I keep looking at it regularly and seeing, okay, is there any show that I really, really like that's going to be coming on soon so I can go and read more about it. And once you do that, you go back and you watch the show again, like, oh, that, that's really a whole lot different. I mean, I've got uh, Final Fantasy and Philosophy here. I've got Harry Potter and Philosophy. I wouldn't mind getting the Big Bang Theory and Philosophy. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, that's what. Uh, I've been watching, uh, because I've got... I've got uh, Cable, direct TV sort of stuff. Mm. And I can pick up the rebroadcast of, of uh, Naked City. Mm -hmm. And you may notice that in the book, I say there are eight million stories in the Naked City, and this has been one of them. Mm -hmm. And I think I am the, one of the books, one of my books, saying there are eight million ways to apologetic, and this has been one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but Naked City has fresh plots that always involve three police characters. But the plots are so different that you, you, you have no idea what you're going to be watching when you begin on your head. Mm -hmm. But we're all about New York. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes place if you get to New York. Uh, New York, there's, there's no staging. It's all something that's going on in New York. Uh, and it is a, it's a nitty gritty, mm -hmm. sometimes show. Sometimes it's very subtle mm -hmm. level. But always it's well acted. And always it's more than it looks like. Mm -hmm. Uh, what it looks like. The last show I watched, uh, a, a, a man who had had stellar character his whole life is challenged. He resists, he resists, he resists, he resists. He finally gives in and as a result murders somebody. And uh, he ends up accepting, accepting the uh, results of his one, if you will, his one big failure. Mm -hmm. uh, but Putting himself into the police and at the same time saving a little boy who has who has thought he was an honest man mm. but losing his whole sense mm -hmm. of life because this young boy's father was the one who engaged in procedures that led this teacher to commit this awful awful sin. Mm. You know, I'm thinking. So, you know, you know what, what are you going to make of that? Well, there's the guy, there's the Christ who goes to, mm -hmm. to the cross. Of course, this is the Christ who has actually committed the crime. Uh, but it's the Christ who, if you will, almost forced into it. And there's a sacrifice mm -hmm. for the boy. There's been someone who's told me years ago he said whenever you watch a movie or TV show if you have a hero and if you have a villain you have the gospel in there somewhere somewhere mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the times when you dub is the times when everything ends up realistic and there are some of these naked city shows that depict a world in which nothing ultimately means anything significant at all. Mm -hmm. uh, film noir comes close to that. Uh, and then there's the code hero, the, the uh, bogey, uh, who uh, represents the man who's, who has a morality that's on his own and he sustains it against whatever else is going on. Well, that's the image of the, if you will, that's the image of uh, the pri of pride. It ends mm -hmm. up being not a good guy, but a guy where you finish that and you go, hey, I'd like to be that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sorry, but that's really not the way to be. Mm -hmm. Much better, in some ways, much better the win. Mm -hmm. The guy gets to get stepped on. Mm -hmm. But that's not right either. So, you're going to be able to get screwed around with in such a way that 
and come away saying, that was a good story, that really told things like it, like it is, and you haven't realized you've bought into uh, an alternate worldview. Yeah, Ravi Zacharias has made that point that we uh, have three levers which apologetics and worldview thinking takes place at. Level one is the foundational. You got your Plato, your Aristotle, your Nietzsche, everyone else that's where the arguments are made. Level two is where it's illustrated, and that's in classical literature, movies, television, video games, everything else. And then level three is application with dinner table, conversation, water cooler talk, things of that level. He says most of us don't realize that we're, when we get level two, there's a level one underneath that level and we can just imbibe that kind of thinking without even realizing it's going on. <laughs> the thing that terrifies uh, parents who understand that is what's happening to their kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a we have a a wonderful, bright, intelligent uh, granddaughter who has been reading books that she really shouldn't be reading at her mm -hmm. age. You know, even Susan Harich, Christian English, Christian author, mm -hmm. Starfish novels. That's beyond not just it's not beyond the intellect. Mm -hmm. It's beyond the emotional uh, sophistication and the moral. Mm -hmm. Sophistication, so that, and um, she's having really a lot of difficulty right now. Mm -hmm. She's uh, she doesn't go to Sunday school. The rest of the family does. They've given her freedom. She's not out of high school yet. Mm -hmm. And and then we have those kids in our church. I'm thinking of one uh, right now whose parents are deeply, profoundly engaged in Christian mind and Christian being and Christian mm -hmm. behavior. I have a very bright grandson who just told them not too long ago that he no longer believes in God. Uh, another grandson of mine went through confirmation class and said no. He's a student at the mm -hmm. Christian school. I asked him. I asked another one of the kids who went to the uh, who has a, I think, a, a, has a plus on a Christian uh, view of life. Uh, how, how Christian is the Paul? And both he and my grandson say, well, not at all. I mean, nothing in it is nothing in it ever requires anything Catholic. A Christian, to be assumed. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, thinking about two different people I don't know right now. One was a, a friend of mine. He's got uh, someone who's a cousin or a niece or something like that. He says, her worldview is entirely shaped by Disney. And he is just very, very concerned about her. I mean, about someone else who I emailed a while back after reading their book and I told them my wife and I both have Asperger's and she said oh my son he's a he's got Asperger's too he's very bright he just came home from college and he's cast masters and he no longer believes in God yeah I've uh, seen this one coming before and it, it's a tragedy every time I hear about it because it's so much harder once they reach that point of disbelief to win them back than it is to prepare them beforehand. Yeah, well, my atheist friend, uh, I have an atheist friend who interprets my belief in what he calls the monster god of the Bible mm -hmm. uh, as a misfunctioning uh, of a load. Mm -hmm. Because he thinks the mind is the brain. Mm -hmm. I'm about to sit here and uh, design, uh, tell him, well, I've been into science too, and here's what the phonologists, uh, and here's a picture of the, of the, of the diagram of the brain, the real mm -hmm. diagram of the brain, according to the phonologist. I believe that your problem, and I'm going to point out to one of the not telling things, 
<laughs> that would uh, be leading him to his atheism. Uh, the, the, the point is that he will, he will refuse to pay any attention to what I really said and insists that he does what I mean, what I don't. And this is a scientist. This is a guy who's made some significant contribution to uh, cancer, cancer research. He worked mm -hmm. at the Argonne National Laboratory, uh, just south of, uh, of Dallas Grove. Mm -hmm. uh, major, a major place, a major role. But so, uh, what he says, Jim's brain is wired to believe the foolish things. But my brain is wired to believe what the really intelligent people believe. Those scientists who are members, the 93% of whom are members of the uh, National Science Foundation. Right. <laughs> there are so many errors. There are so many errors in, in that argument. You, you can't start. Right. It's hasty generalization. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a very questionable premise. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of things. There, there is the notion that uh, the truth is a matter of, uh, of uh, well, counting numbers. How many scientists do this? How many scientists do that? Mm -hmm. But the uh, commitment is so great, there's no change. Right. You know, when we get back to talking about the transcendence then, when we're out doing something in the field somewhere, or watching something in our home, or reading a book, and we think we've heard an echo, as it were, a sensing of something transcendent, what do you recommend people do at that point when they think that they've latched onto something transcendent? That's, very, that's a very good question, because in the echoes of the voice, I talk about the ways in which these uh, figures of transcendence are understood. And they can be understood probably by every other worldview than Christianity, but there is a way to explain them. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask, well, why should the Christian explanation of these as the voice of, of the voice of Jesus be any more likely to be true than, say, more than uh, 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 McLean's, uh, Shirley McLean's having right. become such an experience as she rushes down the beach and says, I'm God, and they're raising their hands and crying, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. Uh, what makes her less likely mm. to be a, a genuine, reliable interpretation? Or what makes Carl's, what my, my friend's interpretation, my scientific friend's interpretation, less likely to be true because he attributes everything to the operation of the machinery of our brain. Why is that less likely to be true? Why is that not true? And yet, these are very, very good questions. Mm -hmm. And the answer I would give to that doesn't lie in the experience only. It right. lies in the totality of what one puts together. Mm -hmm. how, how much does naturalism explain? Mm -hmm. That doesn't actually explain why a thought can arise from a of a particular status of, of the neural, neural equipment of the brain. And it certainly doesn't answer the question of why is there anything at all, which is addressed by theistic religions put rather well, and completely a hub for naturalism. In other words, you, there are a lot of reasons why Christianity is true other than the direct perception we are getting to experience whether we have a single trans transcendence. Mm. That's why any one single approach to apologetics is inadequate. What might be is the trigger for a lot of others. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has not thought about God, who gets to think about God, and hear somebody come and give them a, a, a proof for the existence of God, they think, oh my goodness, I didn't know there was that kind uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Now they haven't got the whole thing, but they've got a, they've got something. And what I would say, claim about the Christian faith is that there isn't a thing in the world that is not addressed by the Christian faith. Right. 
Christ, 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 just hates the God he thinks I believe in. Of course, I don't believe in that God at all. Mm -hmm. But he thinks the God of the Old Testament is this monster. Mm -hmm. uh, and does not, you know, he doesn't understand, even though he was raised as a Catholic and had some early training, he has, he has put that all aside. Anything that he learned that was, shall we say, true, he's put that completely aside and abandoned it for a totally naturalistic view. The naturalistic view, which, by the way, he does not respond to my, to my analysis of naturalism as not finding a basis for the difference between good and evil. He refuses to... Uh, the, the arguments he gives back, I can refute very easily. One is that you can observe this in animals, and you can see uh, that uh, how the idea of uh, a moral sense can come about you know, through evolution. I'll admit that that may very well have a major factor in why it is we are what we are, and why it is we have that sense. Mm -hmm. But it does the sense. Mm -hmm. It explains the existence of the sense, even if it does. I don't think it does that very well. Mm -hmm. But let's say it does explain why you and I have moral sensitivity. It doesn't tell you how that moral sensitivity is itself grounded. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help you to decide whether ISIS is right or Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of thinking like, just because we have a sense of, say, something like hunger, for instance, that doesn't tell us whether a certain food is healthy or not, just because it fulfills that sense. And if we have a sense of morality, it doesn't tell us if something that we're doing that sense is good or evil, it just tells us that we're doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that we have, and this is, not, this is universal. I, I, I really don't think that accepting maybe any pathological cases of uh, severe psychological damage, uh, and, and the real, the utterly se severe, you don't have some sense, everyone in the world has some sense of what they ought to do and what they ought not to do. Mm -hmm. And what they ought not to do and what they do, uh, and what I think they ought not to do, they're very deep. I would say it's evil. Mm -hmm. But I, for uh, outside of the sun, planes of the buildings. Almost everybody in the world thinks that, mm -hmm. except the ISIS. But a lot of ISIS does think that, and apparently a lot of people who are not associated with ISIS find attractive something in that, that mm -hmm. the radical uh, ideology, a radically mm -hmm. violent ideology, that entices them to leave wonderful America mm -hmm. for the, the desert. Mm -hmm. In the desert, that's where the truth. That's where the, the truth is. That's where the good life is. I think the desert fathers would probably agree with you on that one. <laughs> agree with, they'd agree with part of it, wouldn't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I can't but think of that. I think Aquinas would have said years ago that the only reason anyone does anything is that they do perceive something as a good, something that they have to decide. They could be wrong. But they're, they're perceiving something as a good. Even the criminal who's committing a crime like rape or murder, he's got some good that he perceives that he's going for, or else he wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it looks like when you're talking about these signals of transcendence, you're saying the experience isn't self-interpreting, so what we need to do is try and find the, the worldview that best interprets the experience for us. Who have you perceived that is the, that is the other? Mm -hmm. What is the other really like beyond the immediate perception? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're looking at Jesus, well, you're looking at the real thing. Mm -hmm. If we don't look at Jesus, we look at what Jesus has left us. Mm -hmm. The disciples who look at Jesus, uh, here's the interesting thing, and you have to explain this. The disciples were with Jesus for a number of years, I kept getting it wrong as to what he was and who he wanted them to be. And even after the resurrection, they asked him, it, are you now going to uh, restore the kingdom? The, the, the kingdom of Israel, yeah. which fundamentalists say means what he's done in 1947, and mm -hmm. reformers say, no, no, no. But, but <laughs> the question itself, as John Spott says, there are errors in it. <laughs> it mm -hmm. does work. Mm -hmm. uh, but they ask the wrong question. The person says, who is my neighbor? 
the short way the story comes back to one question. Mm -hmm. The answer is not. It's not the generic. The answer is well, there's no answer to that question mm -hmm. because what is your stuff? What you are to be the neighbor. You mm -hmm. are the neighbor. You are not the, that's not the point. You are the neighbor, and it doesn't make any difference who you are neighbor to. But you are the neighbor. Mm -hmm. And maybe it'll be a Palestinian, and maybe it will be a, uh, a uh, an Orthodox Jew, and maybe it will be a Muslim. But you are the neighbor. And what mm -hmm. Jesus does is select. A, a actually, he selects a person with a worldview that is inadequate, but is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And says, "Here, be like that guy." Which yeah. is very difficult for uh, anyone to take. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for the Jew to have a Palestinian be a hero of the story. For an American to have a communist be a good guy. Yeah. You know, and sometimes the communist did the communist did something good. We ought to be doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. If it, you're, if you're, it's not what the communist is, it's what the communist does. It displays what he is. Mm -hmm. He is being a neighbor. He should be too. That yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, the, the question so much isn't to ask who is my neighbor, but what kind of neighbor am I supposed to be? Or what kind of, yeah, what, account, what, what counts as being a neighbor? Mm, yeah. Well, the Samaritan. Yeah. He counts as being a neighbor, and you'd be like him. I, I thought it's pretty interesting that story, but in the end, when Jesus asks which one of these showed mercy, or was the neighbor, and the lawyer says, the one who showed mercy. He can't even bring himself to say, the Samaritan, because as soon as he said, you were supposed to spit on the ground immediately, you have to say, the one who showed mercy, and he says, go and do likewise. That's what you teach that, that in a sermon. Uh, you should put it in, tell a story in another way. Mm -hmm. Tell a story so that uh, uh, a member of Al Qaeda mm -hmm. is the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Because of what the Al Qaeda guy is. Well, good thing she's sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that can't be. Well, no. <laughs> That's what the Al Qaeda guy did. But I'm going to have to find that first. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what it would be. Mm -hmm. So, and that's maybe the Al Qaeda guy is has the right religion. Mm hmm Means he has the right behavior. Right. And the right being exhibiting the right character. Mm hmm And so Jesus, ultimately you think, is one where all these echoes point to entirely. Uh well well he, 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 he's not the echo, he's it. Right. Uh, he is the voice that is echoed. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Sire, it's been a fascinating time here, but unfortunately we're reaching near to the end of the program, so it's time we start wrapping things up here. Um, if someone's really liked what they've heard, and I know I have, and they want to find out more, do you have a website or some way they can get in touch with you to find out more about you and your work? I think, I think the best thing for them to do is to do the right thing at University Press. Okay. Get on the line, uh, IVP, IVPress.com, uh, and say, how do I get a hold of Jim Sire? Mm -hmm. uh, and they they all that stuff to me, and I can decide whether I want to start talking about it. I always, let me tell you, I always do. Mm -hmm. It's just that I don't, <laughs> well, well, actually, actually, that isn't quite true. Uh, I have my, I have a uh, email address in uh, the Women of Sandhills book. Mm. But don't bother using it. I never look at that address. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so well, that, that, that's going to be cut out in future editions. Sorry? That's going to be cut out in future editions, right? <laughs> well, if there is no future edition. Mm. <laughs> Where? I'm not going to mess around with a, mm. a book that hasn't uh, been distributed very much. Where? By the way, you could make it. Oh, that'd be awesome. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, with only a few minutes left, if there was one final message you'd like to pass on to the Deeper Waters audience, what would it be? Well, let it be the text 
of the epigraph to apologetics beyond reason drawn from the scripture. Mm -hmm. Hear, look, attend, watch, pay attention. Have ears to hear, eyes to see. When Isaiah was given that, he was told that he should say that and say that he was going to be talking to people who didn't pay any attention to him. And Isaiah says, how long should I speak? And I asked him, God tells Isaiah, until judgment comes. Mm -hmm. And then he turns to the, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, you are the one who has eyes to see and ears to hear. And to you has been given what has not been given to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so it is to develop ears to hear, eyes to see, and pay attention. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Sauer, it's been a fascinating you know, a couple of hours with you, and I think all of us today in the Apologetics community owe you a deck. You've been highly foundational in getting the ball rolling for much of modern Apologetics today, and we really appreciate it. And I, I really hope you've enjoyed your time. It's been a fascinating interview here, and I hope we'll see you again sometime. Well, I'd love to rejoin you. It's been great for me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that next week we've got Graham Veer coming on. We're going to be talking about his book, The New Atheism, A Survivor's Guide. For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off. <laughs>